This morning we're in Romans chapter 9 and we're talking about human responsibility as it's contrasted with God's sovereignty. Let me just say this as we go to Romans chapter 9 this morning that God does nothing that ever eliminates human responsibility. Some Christians get the goofy idea that that they got to wait on God to do every little tickle in their heart before they do anything. Before they're responsible. Well, God tickles me a little bit, I'll go pray. If he tickles me a little bit, I'll go read the scriptures. If he tickles me a little bit, I'll go to church. As long as you have a Bible in your lap and you can read those verses of scripture that admonish you in all of those things, you're responsible to do those things. And you're responsible to do those things under the umbrella of grace. Meaning that you approach every admonition that you see in the scriptures seeking God's grace to walk in the light of it. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you, when you read those admonitions, where the Lord gives me a little tickle, I'll pray. When he gives me a little tickle, I'll go to church. When I feel, when I feel him moving a little bit, I'll do this, or I'll do that, or I'll do the other thing. I'll go preach, I'll go witness, I'll go do that. No, you don't wait for little tickles, little leadings for those things. When the scripture already says those things for us to do, were to do. When the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you, what that simply means is that you seek to give God all that he desires, all that he wants from you. You can find that out real easy by reading the scriptures. But when you read those scriptures, you have to understand that you're a Christian by grace meaning that you're saved by grace. You became a Christian by grace, and you live the Christian life by grace. So you are not just to strike out in the energy of the flesh and do anything that you read in the Scriptures. You strike out to the throne of grace. And you say, Oh God, my Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, may there come grace on top of grace on top of grace into this shallow heart of mine that finds it so weak to do the admonitions of the word of God and flood my soul with grace as I set out now to do the things you've admonished me to do. You know, I found myself getting in traps like that. You study and teach the sovereignty of God. You start thinking, well, you know, when the Lord leads me to pray, I'll pray. When the Lord leads me to do this, I'll do that. When the Lord leads me, that's a cop out. That's a Christian cop out. You ever heard that before? Well, if the Lord leads me, if the Lord shows me, if the Lord says, if the Lord lives. Have you ever read the Bible, the New Testament? The Lord shows you and says a lot of things to you. <laughs> and sometimes we're, we do experience these wonderful things where God moves in our heart. And, you, you know, uh, we could be working on a car, we could be in the shower, we could be doing something and all of a sudden we're fellowship with the Lord and all of a sudden we take off praying and we take off you know getting into the scriptures and it's and it's really wonderful but if you ever notice that doesn't happen all the time that is what you call the exception to the rule we as Christians don't become responsible Christians by operating on the exception of the rule. Okay? We as Christians operate on the rule. What's the rule? Study the Word of God. Feed on the Scriptures. Seek to know your God. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Come to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help you in the time of need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. You have to be careful that once you're introduced to the sovereignty of God, that you don't become a Calvinistic, hyper-Calvinistic person, where you, you are leaning totally and completely on the sovereignty of God to do everything, and you become irresponsible. Hyper-Calvinism is something that teaches sovereignty of God to the point that we don't have to preach the gospel no more. We don't have to pray anymore. Uh, we can live any way we want because after all, we're saved. And once we're saved, we're always saved. And if God's going to save somebody, he's just going to go save them. And, and if God's going to do it, well, he'll just do it. We don't need to pray. That's hyper. That's hyper. In any biblical doctrine, you can go hyper. 
And you have to realize, because of your human nature, you're just like your pastor. I can go hyper. If I can go hyper as a pastor, people in the congregation can go hyper. Have you ever gone hyper, pastor? Oh, yeah, spiritual things. I know I have. I know I have. But you have to be willing to be corrected and adjusted and corrected and be brought back into, into a balance. The key to uh, Christian living really is that simple word called balance. And so what's happening today in Romans chapter 9 is the Apostle Paul is bringing balance. Okay? From, verses 20, from verse 6 to 29, he has just been pouring out on the sovereignty of God, hasn't he? He's saying if anyone has ever come into the kingdom of God, whether it be Ishmael, whether it be, uh, excuse me, Isaac or Jacob or whoever, they came into the kingdom of God, not because they were desiring it or because they were running, but because of God who shows mercy. It's not because of their birth. It's not because anything good or evil they've ever done. But it's because of God's election that his purpose might stand. So that's how people come in. That's how they come in. No one anywhere is responsible for their salvation. God alone is responsible for their salvation. But that is never, ever meant to be misinterpreted that if someone is non-elected, then God becomes responsible for their damnation. We'll find out today that it's not non-election that is responsible for people that are lost. It's not non-election that makes people uh, that that makes uh, people uh, unresponsible for their damnation. You'll find out that what we read here, it is man's responsibility and man's responsibility alone if he's lost. It's man's responsibility if he rejects the gospel. It's the great paradox. It's throughout the entire Bible, especially in the book of Romans. The book of Romans teaches man's responsibility. In Romans chapter 1, for an example, you look at verse 20. We'll just uh, go on over there right now and look at it. I could follow my notes if I'd like to, but I'm not going to at the moment. It says in verse uh, 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What's it say? They're without excuse. Only responsible individuals can be without excuse. When, when I told my mother, when I was a little cocky boy, to go to hell, my dad took the stick to me, and boy, did he take it to me. And he took it to me good. Who was responsible for that whipping? I was. When, you, when people in this world reject the gospel and in essence they're telling God to go to hell, who's responsible for their weapon, the, whip, the whipping they get? They are. But when that same person that told their mother to go to hell was 26 years old, walking out to his car one night, the Holy Spirit came upon me, gave me life, gave me ears to hear and eyes to see, showed me my sinfulness and brought me to faith in Christ. Who was responsible for doing that to me? God. So the Lord is responsible for our salvation. Being called by God, being chosen by God, is that which stands behind you coming to salvation. So that, because that's of God, it makes him responsible for your salvation. But in no regard is God responsible for your damnation. Just like my whipping. My dad wasn't responsible for that. My mother wasn't responsible for that. I was responsible for that. Can you see that? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Acts, or excuse me, Romans chapter 2 teaches us here in uh, verses, verse 15 and 16. It says, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, talking about the Gentiles, that their conscience bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing themselves. In other words, people have a conscience, don't they? They go, law is written in their heart. They know what's right and they know what's wrong. Are they responsible for the wrong they do? 
If they're not, how, why do we got courts? Why do we have judges? Why do we have police officers if they're not responsible? Goes, it says, the, uh, they, they bearing witness between themselves, between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men's hearts by Jesus Christ, according to the gospel, he's going to judge people's hearts and they're going to be accountable for what he finds. If he finds transgressions against the law in your heart, guess who's responsible for that? You are. You're responsible for that. And so, when we get into Romans chapter 9, verses uh, 30 through 33, we're going to get into this, and you're going to find that, and I'll bring it to your attention, that some people will bring the suggestion that after Paul went from verse 6 down to verse 29, and he starts talking about the responsibility of man, that he's contradicting everything that he said. Now, I want to ask you a question before we get to that point. Do you believe the Apostle Paul was called by God? Do you believe that when he wrote three quarters of the New Testament, his epistles, do you believe that he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Do you believe for one moment that he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would write one thing from verse 26 to 29, and then the Holy Spirit would lead him to contradict everything he said? No. So the point is, when you run into the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, you're running into something that does sound contradictory. But when you study the scriptures and you want the scriptures to do their speaking for you and not commentators and not uh, anyone else but the scriptures, in other words, scripture alone, that's it. You're going to go scripture alone. That's going to be your authority. Then you cannot say that Paul contradicted himself. If there is a little confusion there, you have to say, well, the confusion doesn't, doesn't rest with Paul or the Holy Spirit that led him to say what he said, write what he write. The confusion is with me. And how many times have I told you when you run into a passage of Scripture where it appears as though there's a contradiction that you have to stop and look at the Scripture again? Because there's something you're missing. All throughout the Bible, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man are like two friends holding hands. Neither one are opposed to each other. That's why I put it that way. Sovereignty of God is not opposed to its dear friend called responsibility. The dear friend responsibility is not opposed to the sovereignty of God. These are two biblical doctrines. These are two biblical truths, and they walk right down the middle of the road. The problem is, as they're walking down the middle of the road, they're walking among fallen humanity whose hearts are darkened, whose minds have not been enlightened, and to them it looks like it's confusing. But if you went to heaven today and you talked to all those saints up there, not one of them would be confused. If you went and talked to all the angels in heaven, not one of them would be confused. In fact, if you would just go back into the history of the church a little ways and talk to some of the, the great, the great, leaders of the church, you'd find out they weren't confused. You'd find out that all the confusion began back in the 1800s when people started teaching dispensational theology, when they start teaching a man-centered gospel, and to the day where you got, you got it in most churches, well, I just feel in my heart that there's somebody out there that needs to be saved right there. Would you just raise your hand and say your prayer with me, and you'll be in. And you can go to heaven. You know what's so wrong about that? You're selling heaven, but you're not talking about being reconciled to God. That's right. Amen. People think by saying a prayer, they, they took the ticket from the lady behind the counter, and now they're going to go be able to watch the movie for eternity. They think by doing that, they save themselves. Because preachers don't understand the paradox between sovereignty and responsibility they feel, well, if you're responsible for the wrong, you've got to be also responsible for the right, for the salvation. But you're not responsible for the salvation. Isaac's not responsible that God came along and made his mother and his father have a child in their old age. He's not responsible for that. Jacob's not responsible that God wanted him and not Esau. Are you listening real close? God alone is responsible. 
But because this is not rightly divided, that's why the gospel presentation, at least in America, and I'm sure it's everywhere else, is so far into the sewer, it's not a bit funny. You have people in such massive numbers believing that they are Christians because they did something. A true Christian might be confused a little bit on this, but when you get right down to the bare, bare brass, brass tacks about all this, they know without a doubt that they're a Christian because of God and because of something God did in their heart, something God did in their life to bring them to a place of walking away from their sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and having no hope in themselves, no hope in the church they once attended, no hope in sacraments and all these different things they once had hope in, no hope in any of these things, but in Jesus Christ and His shed blood, that by the means of His death and His death alone are they reconciled to God. And if it were not for His death, they would not be reconciled to God. Can you understand that? I just, whether you know it or not, I cut through about four pages of notes. Just got right to it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's nice, isn't it, to do it that way? Thank you, Lord. So let's look, look at verse 30. What shall we say then? Apostle Paul comes to this and he says, what should we talk, what should we say? I, I just gave you all of this. How, what should I say about all this? This is my conclusion. In verse 30 to 31, he's going to make his concluding statement. He's going to present the facts before us. In verse 32, he's going to explain those facts, which is basically why Israel is on the outside. And why Israel is on the outside is the same reason why everyone is on the outside. In verse 33, he's going to give us an incredible quotation from the scriptures that's going to support his explanation. For the life of me, I can't believe that anyone, and there's some brilliant people that actually say that Paul was confused and contradicted himself, writing volumes of Christian literature and commentator, and commentator, uh, commentary, I can't say it today, Commentary. commentaries, thanks Rick, I'm glad you're here, what is it, I need, I need Dana in my life, I have, I used to have uh, Mr. Bodner, he, he kind of gave up on me, Dana. Maybe you could help me. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I get a twist in there, and I can't get it out. Rick shows up. Thank God for Rick. So what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. And what that actually should read that the Gentiles did not pursue righteousness meant that they had no interest in righteousness. Have attained righteousness meant that they have eagerly taken righteousness. It doesn't mean they attained it by something they did. It just simply means that word attained there means they apprehended. And it's even stronger than that. It means that they eagerly, eagerly went after and took righteousness. Went after, or actually it means that they eagerly had taken righteousness. Even the righteousness of faith. That why did they do this? The Gentiles did not stumble at the preaching of Christ as the Jews did. Right now, you can thank God from the bottom of your heart that you did not reject Christ as the Jews did. Because it was His grace that came into your life that took you out of that position of being a Christ rejecter. Now, someone says, well, I never rejected Christ and they're lost. You haven't? Then why do you live the life that you live? A sinful life is a sign that you've rejected Christ. Going to a church to teach his false doctrine is a sign that you've rejected Christ. See, some people haven't rejected the historical Christ, the nice Christ, the Jesus that died. The Jesus that was born of a Virgin Mary in the manger. We celebrate him, sing songs about him at Christmas time. And the Jesus that was so nice to make bread and fish for lunch. They believe in that Jesus. But when you take that Jesus and you bring him to the cross, 
And his cross says that you're so ungodly, so undone, so helpless, so hopeless, that there's nothing found in you and there's nothing found about you and there can never be found anything in that you do that could possibly put you right in the sight of a holy God. So much so that I, the eternal Son of God, that created all things, and all things were created by me and for me, and through me, I had to come out of eternity into time. I had to dress up with flesh. I had to put on human flesh, and I had to represent you and live a life that you could not live and pay a price for your transgressions that were too steep for you to ever pay. And if it were not for God sending me, there would be nothing that even God himself could do to save you. In other words, the cross tells you that you are undone. Your daughters are undone. Your sons are undone. Your mothers are undone. Your parents are undone. Your families are undone. Your children are undone. Your neighbors are undone. There's nothing. They are in such a hopeless, hopeless, hopeless situation. That's why it is a fallacy for you and I to talk to people about, well, you know, you just need the Lord. You just, you just need the Lord. So when you say you just need the Lord, they mean, oh, yeah, you mean I need that Jesus that, you know, was born, was that a, of a virgin? On uh, Christmas morning, they, they put him in the manger. Didn't somebody kill him on a cross? I need him. They don't know what in the world you're talking about. Paul said, when I come among you, I don't determine to know anything among you except this one single thing. I come among you determined to tell you about Christ and him crucified and him doing for you what no other person could possibly do. Not an angel, not a prophet. God and all his great ability could create another being greater than he's ever created, and that still wouldn't work. Because in order to answer God's holy law, it took God, who is holy, to answer it. It's a great mystery. God is manifested in the flesh. Preached among Gentiles. And raised to glory. What a wonderful thing, everybody. So in verse 30, what shall we say then? We talked about so much from verse 6 down to verse 29. That these Gentiles that, who did not pursue had absolutely no interest whatsoever in righteousness. They didn't know that they were under the wrath of God. They didn't know that they needed to be reconciled to God. They didn't know that they've ever offended God. They didn't even know anything about God. That they have now eagerly accepted and taken to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness that is preached through Jesus Christ, they've taken it? What do we say to these things? What is he doing? He's answering verse 6 and all the way through. Verse 6 says, for this is the word of, uh, or where is it here? Verse 6, but this is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. Paul is summing it all up. You got it confused here. You think because God called Abraham, he called you to salvation. But God called Abraham that he might have you as a nation that would proclaim him. In other words, you were the premier nation that God was going to address. And he addressed you and addressed you and you rejected him days without number. And now judgment is coming to you. And the proof of that judgment is the Gentiles that God had nothing to do with, has everything to do with. And you that he had everything to do with, he has so little to do with, that only a remnant of you will be saved. <coughs> now, that's, you, when you think about this, this is really amazing. Think about the ungodliness of humanity. When you have God himself coming down on a mountain, giving Ten Commandments, giving directions about a tabernacle, a sacrificial system, Sending you prophets, manifesting himself like he's never manifest, manifested himself ever before. And he's doing this constantly and constantly, generation after generation with the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are rejecting him. Is God responsible that they rejected him? Or are they responsible? They're responsible. 
But when I think about that, when I read the Old Testament, I think to myself, these people are nuts. These people are crazy. Why are they doing this? Can't they see who's here? Can't they understand what's the matter? They can't see. They can't understand. They're blind. The Bible says if our gospel will be hid, it's hid because the God of this world has blinded the minds of those lest they should believe. They're blinded. Is God responsible of their blindness? Where did their blindness begin? Back in the garden. Adam. That's when the blindness began. How do you know blindness began then? Because God had to come look for Adam. Adam, where are you? Adam wasn't saying, God, where are you? Blindness was so deep in Adam and got passed on to all of humanity that Adam didn't see any need for God. All he seen was need for excuses. It's all he's seen. Needs for excuses. It's that woman you gave me. And the woman says, well, it's the, it's the serpent. The serpent was already in trouble because he already had done this. He had already fallen. Do you understand this a little bit, folks? We've got to get these things in perspective here. But verse 31 says, but Israel... Pursuing, the same word pursuing. They were eagerly pursuing the law of righteousness. Eagerly pursuing it. But they have not attained it. Meaning they have not eagerly grasped it. They have not eagerly taken it. It says they have not attained to the law of righteousness. They're pursuing the law of righteousness, but they have not attained the law of righteousness. Why didn't they attain it? Why didn't they attain it? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Verse 32 says, why? Then it gives you the answer, because. They did not seek it by faith. But why didn't they seek it by faith? Why didn't they? Why didn't they seek it by faith? But as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. In other words, when they seen Christ and they heard of Christ and they heard of his claims and they heard his message and they experienced his grace and his favor and his healings and all the things that he did, they didn't want him. And when they had the opportunity, they outright rejected him and crucified him on the cross. In other words, people that are into works, people that are into religion, by and large, have stumbled at the stumbling stone. They don't see value in Jesus Christ. I was into works. My mom and dad were into works. All of us in this building were into works. Why were we into works? Because we were stumbling at the stumbling stone. What does that mean? We couldn't see no value in him. We seen value in him on a Sunday morning. We seen value in him as something that we do as religious people. But we never seen the value of him as someone coming to save hopeless and helpless individuals that were under the wrath of God that needed to be reconciled to God. And the only way they could ever be reconciled to God is by his death. We never seen it. We may have heard it, but we never seen it. Have you ever talked to somebody and you could tell by talking to them they weren't hearing what you're saying? That's where you and I were for years. We were hearing things, but we weren't hearing it. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, not seeing, not hearing, when we were dead, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, having no interest whatsoever in God. Having no interest whatsoever in God. Let's look at that just for a moment. Having no interest whatsoever in God. Look over here at Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 1 or 2. Ephesians 2, then Ephesians 4. Having no interest... Ephesians 2, 3 says, Among whom also we all once with conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. That's our resume. Does that look like a bunch of people that are, that are running after God? Does that look like a bunch of people who have any interest in God? Does that look like a bunch of people that even might even have a slight interest in God? 
But see, you and I were doing all of those things while we were going to church. Yeah. See, we had no real interest in God. Laura said to me something one long time ago. He won't say it no more, but a long time ago he said, you know, I thought I always loved the Lord <coughs> because he went to church. But he didn't only go to church, but he'd sit at a bar drinking all the time. Probably cussing and cursing too. So everything that he did was in the context of him being dead. Actually having no true interest. See, it's one thing to have, just to use the word interest, and it's another word to have true interest. True interest doesn't come until God comes. That's why you read in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses and sins, what did he do? He made us alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up together, made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, 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 for by grace, 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 you have been saved through faith, that instrument called faith, than that not of yourselves. It is the gift, the gift, the gift, the gift, the gift, the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, not the workmanship of the Catholic Church, not the workmanship of Grace Christian Church, not the workmanship of a preacher calling us up the, to say a prayer. We are the workmanship, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared beforehand, had intended to do this beforehand, that we would walk in these things. Look at our resume. And our resume only changed because God butted in. Got Ephesians right there? Go to verse chapter 4. Verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walked. How did they walk, by the way? Well, they walked in the futility or the emptiness or the vanity of their minds. That's how they walked. Do people who walk in the futility and the vanity of their minds have any interest in God? Romans 9 says, they pursued not righteousness. The Gentiles who pursued not righteousness eagerly has taken to righteousness. Somebody said, well, the reason why these Gentiles got saved is that they're just smarter than the Jews. I don't think so, everybody. If this was your resume and you're going to hire somebody and they put their resume, Ephesians chapter 2... Verses 2 through 3 on your desk, would you say, I'm going to hire them? I don't think so. How about this one right here? On your desk, the resume says, they walk in the futility, the emptiness, and the vanity of their mind. <laughs> Having their understanding darkened and alienated from the life of God, the one who created them, the life of God, because the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Oh, I'm going to hire you. Who be in past feeling, having given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness. That's the bunch right there. That some people, in commentators, some people would suggest the reason why the Gentiles did it is because God gave the Jews the law. And the Gentiles never got the law, and they were better off because they didn't have the law. They were better off, Annie, because they never had the pillar cloud by day and the pillar fire by night. They were better off because they, had, uh, because they didn't have Moses. It's God said, take off your feet. You're on holy ground. They say the Gentiles are better off because they didn't have what the Jews had. They didn't have the tabernacle, but the Gentiles were better off. They didn't have the priesthood, but the Gentiles were better off. How can people claim to have some smarts, to write something in books, and say that the Gentiles are smarter than the Jews. That's why the Jews pursued the righteousness of the law, and the Gentiles pursued the righteousness of faith. When the scripture tells you why they pursued what they pursued, or why they didn't pursue what they pursued, they stumbled at the stumbling block. They couldn't get past Christ to get to faith. They get, couldn't get past Christ to get to faith. But the Gentiles could look at Christ and come to faith because of God. Because of everything you read in verse 6 all the way to verse 29. When they heard the preaching of the gospel, God started turning on the lights. God started turning on the lights. He starts showing mercy to whom he'll show mercy, and show compassion to whom he'll show compassion. That's why. 
That's why. That's why Steve Hansel not having one single thought in his heart or his mind about getting saved, walking out to his car, was going to go home and crack, uh, pop open uh, a Slitz can of beer and sit down and watch TV and have some popcorn. On my way out the door, what happened? As I walked up, God came after me. I'm, I was called by God. Some people say, well, these Gentiles, you know, they're not much. Let's go over here to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And let's look at, uh, I believe it's chapter 1. And the Apostle Paul speaks of these Gentiles at the, in, at the church of Corinth, and this is what he says to them. He says in verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Who does the saving? Who does the saving? The pastor? The preacher? The Roman Catholic Church? Who does the saving? It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. The message isn't foolish, but it's foolishness to the wisdom of this world. To save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the, to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, in a sense, because it's foolishness to the Greeks, Christ is somewhat a stumbling block to them. Stumbling block means that you're offended. The Greeks weren't really offended at Christ. The Jews were. They were offended at him. Who do you think you are? You're saying you're the Messiah? You were born in Bethlehem and not Jerusalem? Who do you think you are? You're brought up with a carpenter and not a, some majestic person? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Claiming to be the Son of God. Who do you think you are? Allowing these people to take you. Who do you think you are? Up there on the cross. You're such a great person. You healed so many people, did so many wonderful things. Come on down from there. We'll believe on you. They're mocking him the whole entire time. They rejected him. He was not what they were looking for. He was not what they're looking for. So they continued to pursue the law of righteousness. They began to continue to pursue what they thought was the high road and the only road to righteousness, which was the keeping of the Ten Commandments. They didn't know what Paul found out, and we found out ourselves in Romans chapter 7. When Paul said, I was alive once without the law, but when the law came, I died. They didn't know the spiritual characteristic and aspect of the law. That the law went deeper than your actions. It went into your thoughts. It went into the imaginations of your heart. It went into the intentions of your heart. The Lord said, if you have anger in your heart, you've murdered that person. And if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with that person. In other words, Paul said, I never knew covetousness until I seen thou shalt not covet and then all manner of sinfulness arose within me in other words they never really seen the law for what it was because they had no interest in the law who has the greatest interest in the law God he has so much interest in the law that when he comes to save you, he opens up the truthfulness of the law to your heart and the secrets of your heart are revealed to you and you see who you are and what you are and you know that you need a savior. You know that the Roman Catholic Church isn't big enough. You can stack Pope on top of Pope for a thousand billion years. Not one of those popes have enough in their voice to ever save anybody. All the television preachers don't have anything. Your pastor doesn't have anything. You don't have anything. The only person that has anything that can save you is God. And he has that in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross. So we come here to 1 Corinthians. And he says this in verse 26. To the people who think, well, the reason why these Gentiles are coming in is because they're smarter than the Jews. Oh, really? 
These dead people that couldn't come alive until God made them alive. These people whose hearts were darkened. They were smarter than the Jews. Well, what about this? Verse 26. For you see your calling, your calling, brethren. Where did that calling come from? It came from God. For you see your calling, brethren. I love that word calling, don't you? I just love that word calling. Verse 24 says, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. Notice how it says that in verse 24. But to those who are called. What gets you in is the call of God. The call of God comes because you've been chosen by God. What keeps you out is not that God hasn't chosen you or God hasn't called you. What keeps you out is that you have rejected the gospel. You're responsible for your rejection of the gospel. Just like Pharaoh was responsible for rejecting Moses. Just like the people during the days of Noah were responsible for rejecting Moses as a preacher of righteousness. They rejected it. The Jews are responsible because they rejected the law, though they thought they were keeping the law. They actually rejected the truth of the law. And when Jesus came in the Sermon on the Mount and opened up the truth of, truthfulness of the law to them and convicted them, it angered them. So it angered them. What are you angry about? Because we don't have no interest in it. So he says in verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, at the church of Corinth, you see your calling that not many are wise, Kind of blows out this whole idea that the Gentiles were wiser than the Jews. Now many are wise according to the flesh. Now many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen, what did God choose? He chose the foolish things. So Randy, you're a foolish thing. Amen. To put to shame the wise. To put to shame those that think they can do it on their own. God has chosen the weak things. That's you, Rick. You're one of the weak things of the world. But to put to shame those that think they're mighty and big. And the base things of the world. And those things which are despised. That's why he chose you, Pastor. God has chosen. That the things which are not. That's what you are, Pastor. You're a not. To bring nothing the things that are. Now, why did God do this? Is God saying that he's putting a premium, premium on ignorance and weakness and no, he's not putting a premium on that. He did this to show the wise that these people's lives are changed. These people's lives are transformed, not because of anything within them. Everything within them is wrong. There's nothing within them that can produce what you're witnessing of them as Christians. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 29 that, 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and redemption, that as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Folks, don't ask me why God ordained some and not others. I don't know. I'm not told in the Bible. All I know, I know nothing actually except what I'm told right here. Neither do you. The great beams in heaven surrounding the throne of God don't even know. They're a whole lot smarter than Annie and Joe. And they don't know. Where does that leave Annie and Joe? Those great beings at the throne cannot understand his mercy towards us, and yet they're trying to do that. We are here looking into his mind of the eternal God, and we are not meant to understand his infinite wisdom. When you see the sovereignty of God, responsibility of man, you see it, you've got the infinite mind of God right there, and that's too deep for you to go walking around in trying to figure it out. You're not going to be a, you can't figure yourself out. How in the world can you figure this out? Once again, but of him. But of him. Not of the Roman Catholic Church, not of you, not of the preacher, but of him. But of God you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, who became from us. From 
He became for us from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That it is written, he that glories, you and I, that glory, we glory in the Lord. We know that our salvation is not of anything of us. Is he alone who does save? And as many as were ordained to eternal life, the Bible says in Acts chapter 13, verse 48, as many as they were ordained to eternal life believed. What was responsible for them believing in Acts chapter 13, verse 48? The fact that God had ordained them to eternal life. They believed. Your believing is a proof that you have been ordained. Your believing is the first sign of a new mind that's now in you. Remember 2 Corinthians 2.14? To the natural man, these things are foolish. He cannot, he cannot understand them. He cannot receive them. The fact that you can receive them means that you are no longer a natural man. You have become a spiritual man. You're a new man. What does that mean? You've been born again. By the grace of God, you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Let's raise our hands and thank the Lord. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are who we are by the grace of God and not of ourself whatsoever. Lord, let this word penetrate our hearts and keep us in Jesus' precious name. Amen.